Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Did you know that back in 2017, one in eight American adults had struggled with both alcohol and substance abuse, which at that time equated to about 20 million people. In that same year, about 38% of adults had battled an illicit drug use disorder. Now, obviously, those numbers have increased with the pandemic. We don't know what those final numbers are now, but addiction is a huge problem in our society. And I'm sure if you really look at your friends list or your family's list, there's probably someone that you know that is battling some sort of addiction. What's up, everyone? I'm Brian Carroll, and I'm here to help people move more, eat well, and be adventurous. And in today's episode, I have Dennis Barry on the show to chat with us about ways to break free of those addictions. He was an addict himself, and he went through the worst of the worst, and he came out the other side. So it's it's hard to get people to t- want to transition out of their addiction, especially if they don't recognize that they are addicted to certain substances. But what we can agree on is a lot of people would rather have a happier and more fulfilling life than just being addicted to these different substances. So in this episode, Dennis is going to give us different steps to reach out to people that we know that have an addiction issue and how to possibly guide them in a way to start changing their lives for the better. So Dennis is a master life coach who helps people to recover from helpless and hopeless situations and to find inner peace, success, and mastery in every area of their lives. And he's been sober since 2003, so he knows how important it is to have a positive direction in life. So let's go dive into my conversation with Dennis. Thank you, Dennis, for coming on to the show. Thanks, Brian. Nice to be here, man. Really happy to meet you and uh, just like shoot the breeze a little bit. Yeah, of course. And we have a lot to cover. But before we start talking about addiction, recovery and all that type of stuff, let's learn a little bit about your background and what got you to where you are today. Sure. Well, um, I spent uh, my whole 20s. So I'm almost 50 now, but I spent from uh, 1990 to 2000 up and living up in the mountains in Vermont. And I was, I'm an old ski racer, party chef guy and led that type of crazy wild lifestyle. And, uh, it just went on and on and it was fun for a little while and then it wasn't as much fun. And then I couldn't stop. And eventually when I was 31, I was able to, um, stop and, I realized it wasn't just about stopping drinking and drugging or whatever it is. It was about like changing your perspective on life, learning new ways to live, becoming healthier and spiritually grounded. And um, that that's really what leads to like contentedness and happiness. And that's kind of the path I took. And uh, right around that time early on in my recovery efforts, I started coaching people. And I've been doing that for about 15 years. And it's, I love it. Every morning I get to... I wake up and I kick the the covers off and I'm like, my life is just great. And so I I want other people to have that same enthusiasm for life. And that's kind of what I do. And that's the 30 second version of a really long story. (laughs) So um, you had your addictions that you were battling. And then at some point, something must have flipped for you to make you want to change. So what was your kind of rock bottom that was that moment that you decided now's the time to change sure and to and to flash back a little bit you know when i was five years old my grandmother said to my mother she said he worries like a little old man you know so at five years old i was already full of all the fear and insecurity and the and the the anxiety of life except and and like most people it's a big, scary world, and I just had zero coping skills. I had no idea how to get through it. And so you fast forward to when I was 15, I took a first drink, and I was like, <sighs> like it was like this relief that I didn't have to feel that way anymore, and I, I didn't have to feel anything. And then you fast forward to everything I just told you about my, my 20s there. Um, I never learned how to grow up. And you know, at, at the reason most people fail in sobriety, recovery, or overcoming any of their addictions, I, we're talking about drugs and alcohol, but it could be food, it could be any other type of addiction. 
that's out there, there's really like an emotional reason why we're doing all that. And if we just remove the harmful behavior but don't change our lives, then uh, it's really hard to change. You know, it's really hard to give up just the, the harmful behaviors and enjoy life. And then so most people revert back right away. And what happened for me was I was 31 years old. I lost my job. I was 60, 70 pounds heavier than I am now. I was physically dying. And um, I had a girlfriend come over and I was up on a bender for like five, six days. And she came over and I was passed out in my clothes on the couch and I peed my pants. And like the man you see here today isn't the man I, want, I was back then. And she looked at me and she goes, this isn't gonna work. And I just started crying and I said, I can't stop. You know, I, it was just the, the pain got so great that I couldn't stop drinking and I couldn't keep drinking. And it, it's a really scary, sad place to be. So she got online back in the old dial-up internet connection days, which some of you probably don't remember. But, um, and I was in a rehab facility like two days later after that. And, uh, you know, and I just, I continued through. I surrounded myself with people who um, were on the, a, a healthy path. And, cause, and then I learned also it's like growing emotionally, but also physically too. It's the body, mind, and spirit. We, we, like I know you work in health and wellness and helping people uh, eat better and live better lives. And I had to take on all of that. We say in recovery world, we only have to change one thing. And that's everything. Right? I have to change the way I eat, change the way I drink, change the way I exercise, change the way I sleep, everything. And then I, be, I build a happy lifestyle and I become healthy. And I, as a result of living well, I, become, I, I look better. And when I look better, I feel more confident. And when I'm more confident, I can become more successful and do the things I want to do. And it all feeds on each other. But one of the things I notice, and, th and this is what I do in my coaching practice, is like, a lot of us need step-by-step -step instruction. Now, a lot of us are, are afraid to ask for that type of instruction because I feel at the age of 25 or 35 or 40, 45, oh, I should know these things. But I don't, so I feel like a failure. But what I need is step-by-step -step instruction each day to like get to the next level. And so what I do is like we work on finding focus, building specific action steps to get there, and then having accountability and building on that and achieving your goals. And then your life unfolds in beautiful ways. Yeah, when you talk about changing everything, like I could totally see someone recognizing that and going, that is overwhelming. So if you don't have those yeah. steps to start taking to reach that everything, like why would you even start? That sounds way, it's easier to drink. It's easier to do yeah, the it's drugs. Yeah, easier to drink. Yeah, or stay in your, in your addictions, all of us. It's way easier to sit on the couch and watch Netflix and eat a pound of chocolate than it is to write down your goals and then take specific action steps on a daily basis to get there, which is why we have accountability. And then the other thing, like, and everybody always says, if you have one word of advice or what can you offer to somebody? And I say, ask for help. Like, I was taught to have an expert in every area of your life. So... If I get sick, I need to go to the doctor. If I have to go to court, I need a lawyer. If I, I hate doing my taxes. So I, I need an accountant every year. Otherwise, they're not going to get done. I'm going to get in trouble. So if I have experts in those areas, I'm free to go do these other things. And I don't know if I don't know how to conquer my addictions or if I don't know how to build my business or grow my business or write that book or improve my relationships, ask for help. And then I'll get there faster and at a high level. Yep. Yeah, I don't know of anyone that likes doing taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody does. Don't like paying taxes either. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when when it comes to asking for help, do you think a lot of addicts they would like to ask for help? They just don't know how, or do you think they don't recognize that they could ask for help? Mm, yeah. Great question. I, I think it's a little of both. One good thing about the. Uh, information highway that we have nowadays is that it is out there so you don't even need to be so vocal about it just google where can i get help how do i help this addiction how do i stop snorting cocaine how do i stop eating a chocolate cake every day how do i improve my relationship and when you do those things you can it'll eventually lead you to some help or you can say like a life coach on how to improve my relationships how do i communicate better but again 
ask for help. We when we were growing up, we were taught, especially as men, we don't want to ask for help. It's a sign of weakness, but it's actually a sign of strength. It's actually a sign of strength. And when we ask for help, like I, I don't know how old you are, but you probably always remember having Google Maps or Waze. Or, but when we were growing up, not to sound too old, but we didn't have that. Like we would have to figure it out. And so they always had the, there was a joke, like guys would never stop and ask for directions, you know, and guys would rather drive around for two hours and stay lost. I was always the one who would stop and ask for directions, even though like it made me less of a man. But I was like, I would rather get there in five minutes just by asking somebody than drive around in circles for two hours. Right. So I, I did learn that at some point. It's like asking for help is so much easier than trying to figure it out on my own and banging my head against the wall. And along those lines, for those that are listening, I have a coach, too, and I meet with him every week. And that's why. I mean, I'm a fairly successful, happy, healthy guy, and it's because I continue to grow with the insight of somebody else who's not emotionally attached to what I see every single day. Yeah, for the record, I started with a map and then upgraded to MapQuest and then Google Maps <laughs> map or <Quest>. ways. <laughs> yeah, MapQuest. What was the old maps? There was like topographic, topographical maps and... Yep. Remember the triptychs? Do you remember triptychs? I don't remember those. Those came from AAA. So it's like if you were going, let's say you were in Washington and you wanted to drive to like Florida, it'll give you like, they put these triptychs together based on where, on you, just for you. And it's like this little spiral thing. And you're like, all right, I made it through Washington. Now we're in Nevada. Now we're in here. And you flip the pages and you eventually you get there. Yep. And it's funny. But now we don't need any of that stuff. No, now it's too easy. But right. um, definitely for me, going into like a grocery store, I will walk around that grocery store 15 times trying to find the one thing instead of asking someone that works there, hey, where is this? And I'm slowly getting better at that, but uh, because I recognize how much time I waste by just walking around doing nothing when I could really? just ask for help and bypass all those rows. So Yes, that's the ego. It's like a... It's a pride thing. It's like, I should be able to find that on my own. But you can't. I mean, maybe. I mean, there's certain things that you don't want to give up on and try to figure out yourself so you can learn by yourself and grow to the next level. But sometimes it's just like, just ask for help. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Even Tom Brady has a throwing coach. And yeah. um, Tiger Woods has a swing coach. So everybody, even at the top levels, they still have coaches. Helping That's them out right. and, you know, assessing what they're doing and how they can improve. So it's it's a great point that um, everybody can benefit from some sort of help. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's like when you're, what I was just talking about real quick was the emotional attachment. So it's like the reason couples uh, benefit from help, whether it's coach, therapist, counselor, whatever you want to call it, the couples, you know, when you have a, because I do a lot of marriage and uh, love and relationship coaching, and it's like the two of you are so emotionally attached to your points of view and what you think is right and how they should behave. You can't see anything from outside, mm -hmm. right? So you need somebody who's not emotionally attached to your crap to say, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this behavior? Here's where, why don't you try this? You know, maybe she'll understand what you need if you say it this way. He's like, oh, I never thought of that. Well, yeah, because you're you're here and I'm up here. And not because I'm smarter or better or cooler than you, just because I'm not there emotionally attached to what you see every day. Yep. I like it. Um, so when you recognized you had a problem and then you asked for help, what were kind of the main steps that you had to take to pull yourself out of the addiction and to be able to you know, comfortably get back into society and not have those cravings to fall right back into that, those addictions. Mm, great. And another great question. So in, in my book, I talked about, and originally I did uh, the 12 steps. That's how I originally started. And, uh, but in my book, I talk about um, uh, the how approach to life. So how do I get sober? How do I improve my relationships? How do I become healthier? How do I make more money? And the answer is the question, how? And it stands for honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. So I have to first, and th this is kind of the path I took. So I have to first be honest and say, hey, something's not going well. 
right? I can't stop drinking or snorting cocaine. I can't stop eating chocolate cake. My marriage sucks. Everything's falling apart. So now I've admitted there's a problem. That's the honesty. And then I be once I become honest, then I become open to a new way of living and seeing a different point of view, whether it's from a coach or a ther or somebody on the outside. And then I become willing to apply those things into my life. And it's a very powerful approach to life. And that's kind of what I did. I was like, you know, every morning I would wake up and I would have these circles under my eyes and I was so bloated and, I w and so hung over. And I would look in the mirror and just cry. And I would say, I'm never gonna drink again. And then I would walk over to the freezer and take a little bit of whiskey that I left and just slam that. And then, and I couldn't stop. So something had to come in between the, the thought of drinking and the drink. So instead of like, I, I'm never gonna drink again or, and then I need a drink, I needed to find new ways of living. So I started meditating. I started exercising. I started drinking lots of water. I, I had to stop smoking. I had to start uh, just reading things that would improve on the, who I was yesterday. You know, so I, I don't have to do, like you said earlier, like improving everything in your life, changing everything, it's overwhelming. but. Today, I just need to be better than I was yesterday. Mm. And then eventually I get to that space. And another reason overcoming addiction and alcoholism is hard is because in addiction, generally speaking, our dopamine's getting hit all the time. Like we like the, the quick hit of that first drink. I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm full of anxiety and fear and insecurity. And my life's falling apart. I could take a shot and within 30 seconds, I know I'm gonna feel better. I could feel it going down my, my throat and I feel better. It's instant gratification. Life isn't like that. So I need to learn to calm down. Success, massive financial success takes time, right? Health, looking better, feeling better, it takes a little time, especially if it took me 15, 20 years of, of getting screwed up in my, in my addictions. It's gonna take longer than a week or two to undo that. And we're, we're not good at patience. So this is where learning how to meditate and gradually shift the way that you think will gradually change the way you look and feel. So you had mentioned earlier that a lot of people with addictions, they get into those addictions to uh, kind of cover up something, whether it's like, you know, stress you're dealing with or uh, whatever it might be. So for some people, do you think they enjoy the feeling of their addiction more than what they experience in regular life. And if for those people, if that's true, are you, are you able to pull them out of the addiction? Yeah. Wow. That's a big question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Ultimately there's a lot of things that we don't want to hear in early recovery. You know, so a lot of you hear about a lot about relapse, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people, oh, I went out drinking. And you say to them, you know, the truth is they wanted to drink, no matter how messed up their life is. The truth is they wanted to drink more than they wanted to stay sober. And you're like, how can you say that? Like, my life's falling apart. I lost my wife. I went bankrupt. My health is failing. All these things. I don't want that. But you did. Otherwise, you wouldn't have drank. And like, we like the effect that's produced by the drugs or the alcohol, otherwise we wouldn't do it. But what you said is that, the, is that I would rather drink than to face my feelings or change the way I'm living. And it's funny, not funny, funny, not funny, sad, that it, like you say, well, for in order to get sober, we need to change the way we think act, feel, and all that stuff, or die a miserable, unhealthy, alcoholic, drug addict death. Now, alcoholics and addicts will struggle with that choice. <laughs> like a normal person says, my life isn't going well. I drank too much last night. I got a DUI and, and my relationship's falling apart. I'm, I'm going to stop drinking. Now, somebody who is a real addict or alcoholic or, or suffers from alcohol use disorder, however you want to call it, We'll, we'll go like, mm, yeah, I don't know. Like, maybe 
I can, I can still, I can cope with that a little longer. So it is sad, but you know, the truth is what we need to do is address those underlying issues and it's painful to do. And that's why they say hitting rock bottom is really like the only time when those changes occur. Because when the pain becomes greater, then we're willing to make that change, right? When I'm suffering enough and not until then, because I don't want to face my demons. I could tell you a story about a woman who I worked with uh, a few years ago. So she's middle age, mid, uh, middle, mid 40s. I think she was like 42, 43. And she was drinking like two bottles of wine every night, sometimes more. And then she would get drunk and then she would eat a bunch of sugar and crap. And then uh, her marriage was suffering. The kids were f starting to fall apart in school and everything. And she couldn't stop drinking. And so she came to me because she, she needed to stop drinking. She said, I'm an alcoholic. I need to stop drinking. So we started, we, after about three or four sessions, we, we started talking. And it turns out when she was in sleepaway camp 30 years earlier, she was, she hooked up with this boy. She was 13 years old and he was 15 and they hooked up and she wanted to stop and he didn't and he violated her and she never told anybody about it for 30 years. Now you can only hold that pain in for so long before something happens. So that emotion, that pain, that, that fear, the insecurity, the shame that she felt, the guilt, all that stuff. And plus back then, it, like nobody wanted to hear it anyway. So you just bottled all that stuff up inside. And so we really started working on that and addressing that issue. And when we did, after a few weeks of doing the work, the, the things that I do around that, she just stopped drinking. And she lost 30 pounds. Her skin even looks better. And her relationship got better, the kids looked better, all because we addressed the underlying issue. So we all have that underlying issue. We all have something that happened years ago or so, that produced some sort of shame or guilt or something we never learned how to cope with. And it's when we address those things and unfold those, right? Let pull those out, then we don't need to drink. We don't need to cover up that pain. We don't need to eat a pound of cookies or watch six hours of Netflix or scroll on our phones mindlessly for eight hours or make nonsense phone calls. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. What are you doing? Oh, I'm sitting in traffic. Oh, cool. What are you doing later? Like those are all avoiding feeling, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's afraid to be by themselves. So I teach people how to be comfortable to be by yourself. Yeah, it's interesting that everyone's quote rock bottom is different and you yeah. would think like certain rock bottoms would actually be a rock bottom for some people but then it it's not and an example is a family member of mine um around mid 50s he was an alcoholic abused drugs um he was addicted to like almost 20 prescription drugs and he got himself into a position where he went into organ failure and he's in the hospital. He's literally on death's bed. Everything's shutting down. And all he could think about was he needed to make sure the fridge back at home was stocked up with beer. Because if he does get out, he wants a beer after all this because it's been weeks. And we literally got called in by the nurses and the doctors and said, this is probably, you know, your last time to see him. And somehow he pulled out of it and recovered, but that wasn't his rock bottom. He went right back to the same stuff, and eventually, like seven, eight years later, it took him out. But it, you would think that you're literally on death's door, and that would be your moment to like change, but it wasn't strong enough for him. And like yeah. you said, trying to dig deeper down into more of the root issue that might have helped him, but literally dying was not what was going to help him. Yeah, and it's painful. Remember, we don't like change. So what, really what we're doing is changing. And mm -hmm. as a human, we don't like change. But, like, we're born, right? The very first thing, they take us out of this warm, comfy place, our mother's tummies, where we're fed and it's warmth and everything's really great. And they take us out and the doctor slaps us in the ass. And we're like, oh, that's, hurt. that's painful. So we start crying. And then that, that goes away and then we go to sleep. And then eventually we start crawling. And then we bump into the wall and we start crying. And we learn how to not do that. And then we start walking and we fall down and we cry. 
because, and then we learn how to do that. And we continue to, to grow. And at some point, we've reached like a level that's like comfortable or it seems comfortable. And we kind of hang out there. We're like, because change is hard. We, d we don't like bumping into the wall. So when we find a way to not do that, we d become comfortable. And then you fast forward 30, 40 years. You know, you take somebody who's in their 30s, 40s, 50s or beyond and say, all right, now we just have to change. And that's hard because what we're doing, in essence, is we're taking away our coping skills. So alcohol and drugs or cake or whatever is my coping skill. And so now you're taking away my coping skill and I don't have a new one. And so I sit at home holding onto the table going, now what do I do? And then the next day life kicks you in the balls because that's what life does. And you don't know how to handle it. So you say, screw this. Where's the cake? Where's the drugs? Where's the alcohol? So I revert instantly back to what's comfortable. And so change is hard and not everybody pulls it off. Yep. Now, as I wouldn't say an outsider looking in, but we'll say like a loved one or someone that knows you looking in. If you know of someone that's addicted, how do you reach out to them and try to offer them help? Um, especially, you know, if they haven't asked for help themselves. Is that something that we as other people should do is reach out and be like, you know, open that door. If you at some point do need help, then just know to come and talk to me. Or what? what's the appropriate response there? Yeah, great. You're, you, you're asking all great questions, Brian, really. And so the, the, the best way to be there for somebody is to be there when they need help. Mm -hmm. And what we can do along the way is drop hands. We can, it depends on, and a lot of it's personality based. It depends how open they are. Some people are in that desperate position where they will listen to you and, and have that honesty, open-mindedness and willingness to change. And, and there are no failed attempts. So it's not like, oh, I tried talking to him, but he doesn't want to hear. You're planting seeds. You might tell that person something that uh, might not, that seed might not sprout for 10 years. You might say, here, here's a book that might help you. Here's, a, here's somebody you can talk to. Here's a treatment center you can go visit. And they might be like, yeah, screw you. I, I'm not. And then, but five, they're thinking in the back of their head as their life's falling apart. Oh, I can always reach out there. Like you planted that seed. So the be and and be there if they call and need somebody to talk to. Be there if they call and ask you a question. Be there. That's the best we can do because you can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you can be there and be present when they do reach out for help. That's the best thing. And like I said, drop hints. Like you know, throw a book on their table. Throw a phone, throw a phone number, shoot them a phone number through text message or something like that. Or again, it's all personality based. Sometimes people are willing to listen to what you have to say and then push a little harder. And if they, what happens is if you start pushing and then you feel them pushing back, just stop because and go take care of yourself. That's the best you can do. Mm. Yeah. yeah. If you are helping someone um, and let's say they reach a point where they relapse and I don't know, they do something to you. Maybe you're helping them and um, maybe at some point they relapse and then they steal something from you to go buy drugs or whatever it is. Um, I know that can be very difficult for the person trying to help, but also there's probably a component in there that it's not really um, anything directly against you. It's just them falling back into bad habits. So... If you are helping someone, how many chances do you give someone before you're like, okay, I'm not the person that's going to help you. You're going to have to find someone else. Love that. So what you're talking about is like, there's a bunch of things there. Enabling, codependency. Those are all uh, part of this equation. And, the, and this is all part of coaching. What we do is we need to establish boundaries. Now, everybody has a different threshold. So if you're a mother... Your, your threshold for your son is most likely pretty high. You're going to keep helping and helping and sending money and bailing them out of jail and you know helping them as much as you can because you want to help, 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 help. But the truth is you're not helping because if you keep doing that and it's not working, then it's not going to work. If it was going to work, it would have by now. 
right? It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't be going on for 10 or 20 years. So what we need to do in this work, this is whether it's a parental relationship, friends, a romantic relationship, is we need to establish boundaries. And those boundaries need to have consequences. So otherwise, they're, you're just being a nag, right? So if you're like, you know, if, you, if this happens again, right, you can live here, but if you go out drinking and come home at two in the morning and break the uh, chair, then you can't live here anymore. And they come home and they break a chair and you, you, they continue to live there. Well, you, you just train the subconscious mind to say, oh, well, nothing's going to change. I don't need to change. A great example, and this goes, remember, just like the girl who was violated in that story, this goes back to early childhood. And most of our uh, unhealthy behaviors and beliefs do. But let's take a five-year-old kid at the park with mom. And the kid's playing in the playground, and he punches another kid. And mom's talking to her friend, and that other kid starts crying. And mom says, if you do that again, we're leaving. And 10 minutes, again, 10 minutes later, the kid punches another kid, and the kid starts crying, and they don't leave. So we just train that kid that it's okay to hit people. It may have, might have been seemed subtle at the time, but it's not. We just train that kid's subconscious thinking to say it's okay. So guess what? In 20 years, he's in a relationship and he hits his wife because that's what he was taught, that it's okay to do. And if his wife says, if you do that again, I'm leaving, and he does it again and she doesn't leave, then we're confirming that that behavior is okay. So it's the same thing with drugs and alcohol behavior. And in my practice, I'll even have uh, specifically a contract in place. It's not a legal contract, but it's an agreement between the parents and the kids or the husbands and the wives or the, whoever it is that says these are the agreements. If you want to live in this house or in this relationship, no drinking, no drugs, in bed by this time, meditating, meeting with Dennis, eating well, like all, whatever the contract says. And if the contract's broken, then we have to enforce the consequences. Otherwise, there's never going to be any change. So everybody's different. Boundaries with consequences is the, the short answer for the long answer I just said. And if you are the helper, what do you do about your own personal guilt? So like if they breach the contract and you kick them out of the house and now they, you know, they had gotten a lot better, but they screwed up a little bit. You kick them out of the house and now they just went off the deep end again. How do you help yourself with that guilt? Man, did you research these questions? Because these are awesome. These no. are great questions. <laughs> I just love off it. the yeah, top of my a, head. Yeah, you're a great host. Well, now we have to take care of you. And if we're not taking care of you, I mean, this is classic codependent behavior, right? So somebody who's independent and confident and assured and is taking care of themselves doesn't have this issue. They're taking care of themselves. Okay, so this is like the, the oxygen that comes out of the airplane. They say, put it on yourself first, even before your little baby. Because if you die, you can't save your baby, right? So we need to take care of you. And it's the same things that, we, the, that the addict needs to do. You need to meditate, take care of your health, drink lots of water, stop eating sugar, go for a walk, uh, learn something new. I mean, like, these are standard things. Take care of yourself. And when you're doing that, you become more confident and self-assured and you don't have the guilt and the shame associated with that because allowing them to keep coming back and affecting your health and happiness and well-being isn't going to improve your life. It's only going to make your life harder. So let's just say the meditating is like 20% of your health and well-being and going for a walk is 10 or 20%. And then the person comes back in and you get in a fight and that knocks you back 30%. And then you're fighting back with eating well and drinking lots of water. You understand? Keep continuing to take care of yourself. It's really the best way. And sometimes a little bit of time, you know, a little bit of time because it, sometimes you get emotionally scarred. Reaching out to, for help from a coach or a friend or a mentor of some sort uh, to talk about how you're feeling. And, uh, you know, just continuing to take care of yourself is always, always the answer. Really, there's a difference between taking care of yourself and being selfish. Right? You're not being selfish. You're, you're establishing boundaries to make your life better. Yep. I like it. Good responses. 
All right. So to continue a little bit more with the conversation. So uh, not only do you work with addiction and recovery, you also work with help guiding people to master their lives, right? So um, if you are pulling someone out of addiction or recovery, and then next step is, you know, start to optimize other parts of their life. How do you know what to choose to optimize next? (laughs) <laughs> That's great. Yeah, well, so center to my coaching practice is what we call the one thing. And there, there's actually a book out there. There's other people talking about it now. But we really want to focus on one thing in life. We really want to get laser focused. A lot of times if we're in an addiction or broken relationships or financial problems, health problems, it's because we're not focused, right? So everybody's like, oh, Uh, I'm a great multitasker, and that's ridiculous. None of us is. Multitasking, it's a myth, right? We really want to get focused. A a great example I like to use is New Year's resolutions. So every New Year's, we're like, I'm going to write a book, lose 30 pounds, start a business, and improve my relationship. And two weeks later, you're like overwhelmed, so you start drinking again and eating cake. and, And next New Year's, it's the same five New Year's resolutions. So... We were unfocused and overwhelmed. So we have these impossible to-do lists and impossible goals that we can't achieve because we're trying to do too much and take the kids to school and look good on Facebook all at the same time. So it's really hard to do. So what we do is get laser focused. Okay, I need to stop drinking or snorting cocaine or eating chocolate cake or whatever it is I'm doing. What, how are we going to improve our lives? Sometimes that's the one thing. So what I do is focus on the main areas in life. And so how do I feel about my body? How do I feel about my body and my health, my relationships, my family and friend relationships, my finances, my career, and my spiritual life? Those pretty much encompass life, those six, seven categories. How do I feel about myself in those areas? And where would I like to be in each of those areas? So now we've just established goals. And now we're going to pick the one goal there that's going to change our life the most. That's going to give us the confidence, the happiness, that, that breathing room to feel good about ourselves so we don't need to go drink and we don't need to screw our lives up that way. And then we work on that specific one goal on a daily basis, and it's called the one thing. And we work on it strategically every day with specific action steps to take to get that done. So within a month or six months or a year, depending on how big the goal is, Now we're becoming successful. And then when that's done and we've achieved that goal, we move to the next one thing. There's always a new one thing. There's always ways to improve our lives. And when we do, there's no room for drugs or alcohol or watching six hours of Netflix or we're working on becoming happy and fulfilled. And that's what I do. Perfect. Well, if people want to learn more about you, then you have DennisBerry.com. And you do uh, consults. Is everything virtual for you? Yes. Yes, because I live far away. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, we meet by Zoom. I have clients in New Zealand and Australia and Europe and Canada, all over the U.S., and I can meet anybody anywhere. And, uh, yeah, head over to the website. And if you're listening to the show, I'll offer you two free sessions to uh kickstart everything first one is always free because to make sure we click and then uh but i'm offering you a second one if you mentioned brian today well thank you for that uh people definitely should jump on that and just uh you know chat with you see what they can master in their own lives and how you can help is there any final things that you want to make sure that you share with us when it comes to addiction recovery and life mastery Uh, you know i always say ask for help that I had a guy in, uh, at the gym a few months ago. He's like, Dennis, he knew who I was, what I do. He goes, Dennis, you have any advice for a young kids who's just starting out? And I said, keep asking for help. You know, when I, when I think I know the rules, the rules change. You know, we never really arrive there. It's like we can always continue to be better. We can always improve. And um, when we continue to ask for help, we continue to grow. So if you're stuck ask for a way out. You don't have to do it all by yourself. In fact, if you keep trying to do it by yourself, you rarely get where you want to be at a very high level. So if you have somebody to guide you through the process, you have a better chance of getting there. Yeah. What's the saying? If you travel by yourself, then you can travel fast. But if you travel with a group, then you can travel far or something similar. Yeah. I haven't heard that, but I love it. It's so true. And that's in regards to like wolf packs. 
Yes, I love it. Love it. Yes, please. Just ask for help. And I don't care if you call me or Brian or your best friend or your your friend's friend's br brother's roommate. Just like ask for help. If you don't want, if you can't afford it, or if you if you um, don't feel like asking in a formal atmosphere, just find somebody who says who's like, "Wow, you're successful and healthy and happy. Can we go get some coffee?" Uh, I have a few questions for you. Just do that. Like make it make an attempt to get better, and you will become better. Yep. I think people are, are a lot less scary than we tell ourselves when we're thinking about asking for help or not. And yeah. if, if you just reach out a little bit, people are a lot more open to that type of stuff than you would think. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Really good, good stuff. You're a great host. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dennis. This has been awesome. And for uh, anyone that might know someone that you know is battling addiction or anything similar definitely listen through this episode again and pick up on some of the stuff that we talked about and see if you can apply it to the people you love again if you look at your friends or family circle i'm sure you can find someone that is having some sort of addiction issue and it might be a good time for you to just reach out and see if there's anything that you can do for them even if you're just planting the seed that if they are ready to make a change you're going to be there for them and you can help support them so if you need that extra help contact dennis and he can definitely help you out to figure out the direction to go but just help the people that you know that are battling different addictions especially with the pandemic addiction levels have increased dramatically there's a lot of people that are suffering from addictions and they don't need to be It'd be best if we can figure out how to support them the best way we can. Uh, we do have resources over at the show notes for the episode, which is at summitforwellness.com slash 156. So head on over there and you can see all the resources over there. Next week, I have Jeffrey Smith on the show. Let's go learn who he is. I am here with Jeffrey Smith. Hey, Jeffrey, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? Well, I have been the leading spokesperson uh on the health dangers of genetically engineered foods for a long time. And what people don't know is that when people originally came up to me as I was traveling around the world saying, I can notice the difference in my body when I eat a GMO, I didn't believe them. It wasn't until I thought it was going to be some minor change in some epidemiological charts that we could just detect years later. But then I started speaking at medical conferences telling the doctors about the documented health risks, they started putting their patients on non-GMO and organic diets, and they started seeing amazing changes. And I even went to doctor's offices to verify for myself. And then I started asking thousands of people at, at, at lectures and then surveying people for the answers. And now it turns out, I think I've heard more personal testimonials than anyone on the planet about people who actually notice damage to their health by eating GMOs and get, or getting better when they switch to not eating GMOs and not eating the foods that contain Roundup spray. And what will we be learning about in our interview together? Well, we're going to learn about the health dangers of GMOs and Roundup in detail so that it will motivate us to eat organic. But we're also going to hear about a new existential threat where genetically engineered microbes could change the nature of nature. They can spread around the world, they can get in our bodies, they can wreak havoc. So we have, a, there's a new technology out there, gene editing, which if left unregulated, could result in millions of GM microbes, genetically modified microbes, being introduced into the environment, and that could be an unrecallable disaster. So after 25 years of focusing on the health dangers, we've pivoted to try and protect nature now from genetically engineered microbes, an existential threat. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Organic. Organic and organic. I'm not qualified as a nutritionist to say what you should eat, but I am more than qualified to say, please avoid GMOs and Roundup uh, herbicides sprayed on your food. And the easiest way to do that if you don't grow your own, is to eat organic. And what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? 
All right, in addition to eating organic, not everyone can eat organic each time. So if you can't eat organic, at least eat non-GMO, but not just non-GMO. There's also Roundup sprayed on the oats and on the wheat and the barley and the mung beans. It's found in wine, it's found in beer. So at our website at responsibletechnology.org, we have a report which has the levels of glyphosate in various foods, both generic foods and brand names. So if you can't eat organic, avoid GMOs and avoid the high sprayed products like oats in the non-organic category. So eat organic as the first and the non-GMO and non-sprayed as the second and third. Jeffrey is a very fascinating guy and we talked about some very concerning situations with GMOs and uh, the planet and how it could really impact the planet if we release the wrong GMO type organisms. So definitely listen into that episode next week. And until then, keep climbing to the peak of your health.